Uh, yeah, I've from the store this morning where I've been <coughs> with David here, who's another volunteer, and the only here who's our boss. We've been handling some very interesting glass objects from the physics section. Um, but we're now kind of turning away onto something quite different. Um, all the figures that you're looking at, as I was just saying before, some of, the, some of you just arrived, are people associated with the origins of this university college in the early 1880s. Um, William Rathbone, the sixth of that name, uh, one of the very famous Rathbone family in the city. Uh, he and his two brothers were actively concerned with starting this university, both financially and in terms of their influence. Uh, the first principal, Gerald Rendell, came from Cambridge, a Cambridge graduate, Cambridge classicist. And this man here. Now, as far as I can gather, the, the sculptor here is um, Sir Arthur Gilbert, and I think there are only two bits of his work in Liverpool. Um, one of them is in Sefton Park. I wonder if you know what it might be. It's a very interesting statue. It's a copy of an original which you'll find in London. Okay, uh, I'll give you no more clues. You can tell me in about five minutes when we get there. Um, he can, well, it is not Peter Pan, but you're on the right lines. Um, Peter Pan was by uh, George Frampton, but there's also a copy of that. Oh, well, very knowledgeable about it, yes. Uh, <laughs> the Eros statue. Um, let's, let's concentrate on Tate, then, first of all. Uh, this gentleman was asking me, is this the same as Tate and Lahn and the Tate Gallery? Yes, indeed it is. But that all comes later. In fact, Tate and Lahn was not set up until 1921. This gentleman died in 1899. So it's Henry Tate Jr. who actually took the uh, firm into partnership. Henry Tate was born in Chorley in Lancashire, and he was uh, apprenticed to his brother, a brother called Caleb, interesting family name. Um, they were Unitarians, as this gentleman was asking me just now. Unitarian family, his father was a Unitarian minister. And he was apprenticed to his brother Caleb in Liverpool as a grocer. He had a seven year apprenticeship from the age of 13. Uh, in 1839, he set himself up in business. Uh, within 20 years, he had six shops. The first one was in Hamilton Street in Duncan Head. And in 1859, he went into partnership with a man called John Parker, who was a sugar refiner. Ah, perhaps you're thinking, yes, I knew there was a connection. Uh, within two years, he sold his grocery business to his sister-in-law's second husband, if that makes sense, and he goes into <laughs> control of the park business. And in 1869, he changes the name to Henry Tate and Sons. That's Henry Jr. and Caleb, the two other sons, joining the business. Now, Tate might have been sort of, you know, one of several sugar refiners uh, in the city and in the country, but he had a little bit more business mass and I present to you the secret of his success. I'm sure you can see what I'm holding in my hand. Every teacher needs a, a visual aid. I've got one there, and I've got one here in my hand. Madam, what is that? I'm holding a sugar cube. Um, Henry Tate bought three patents. The first patent he bought from a French company for purifying raw sugar. His second patent for the cube he bought from a German refiner called Eugene Lange. Lange sounds an interesting bloke, actually. His father owned a sugar refinery somewhere in Germany. But I think Eugene Lange Jr. was more interested in petrol engines, gas engines, engineering, trains, railways, and basically was happy to sell Tate uh, his uh, monopoly, uh, his patent for making cube sugar. Now before this, sugar had come in huge chunks, loads, and had to be cut. And the cube actually starts in Bohemia in the 1840s. Uh, a man called Jacob Rudd was fed up with his wife uh, asking for small bits of sugar to put in her cups of tea. Presumably she was drinking large cups of tea out of saucepans or something, because she couldn't get small enough lumps. Uh, so he uh, devises a machine to cut sugar into small cubes. Essentially, Tate does the same, but he does it better. And so from 1872, uh, he Builds a new factory in Love Lane in Liverpool uh, to make sugar cubes. He opens a new factory in London in 1881 and he makes a lot of money. He starts buying art in the 1870s. In the 1880s, he's a multimillionaire. The early 1890s, uh, we're coming to the collection with, connection with Liverpool, by the way, uh, shortly. Uh, he offers his collection of 65 paintings and two sculptures, I think both by Thomas Brock, to the National Gallery. But the National Gallery is a bit snooty because Tate's collection is modern art. Artists such as Millet, Waterhouse, uh, Linnell, and others. 
and it's only done because it will have not enough space. So it then takes sense to the government and says, right, here's my collection uh, and £80,000 for a building. <coughs> and after the discussion, the government accepts the offer and they bring in Sydney Smith to design a building which we know is Tate Britain today on the south bank, sorry, on the north bank of the Thames uh, in the Millbank area. It replaced Millbank Prison, uh, which had been knocked down. Tate also made provision for an extension to the gallery, so its total grant is £150,000 plus the collection of 65 paintings and sculpture. And you know, the base of the collection is really um, very much a modern art, considerable pre Raphaelite influence as well. Tate, though, is more than just sugar. Um, his philanthropic work is very important. And so, nationally, uh, clearly the Tate Gallery was his greatest gift to the nation. But he also gave it to um, the Manchester College in London, which was a non conformist college for training um, and educating uh, non conformist people, which they perhaps find difficult to do at other universities and colleges. Uh, he gave money to Bedford College for Women. Uh, he gave money here in Liverpool, if we turn our attention to the city, to the Harman Museum in Hope Street. If you know the building, it's a nice, very big building. Um, it's still there, it's got the inscription. Uh, in 1885, and he gave, I think, some £5,000, £10,000 to the Harman. Uh, he gave money to the Royal Infirmary, uh, designed by the same architect as designed this building here, like the Water House. And as far as the University College was concerned, uh, let's look and see what he did here, because this really is why this bust comes to be here. Uh, his contribution started in 1883, um, at a time when Liverpool University College was struggling to set itself up, it needed to be more firmly established, and Tate was one of the people who gave £5,000 to sort of broaden the curriculum. In 1887, he gave £1,000 when there was a fund started to build the building we're sitting in now. More than that, though, the next year, he offered £16,000 to pay for the library wing. The architect had designed the buildings in three blocks, and the library wing this end, um, Tate offered £16,000. He was later persuaded to raise that to 20,000, partly to pay for the oak floor, which he insisted on having from his library and some of the furnishings. Uh, he also gave about 5,000 pounds for books, though I have seen a document which says it actually is 10,000, <coughs> which actually states he gave 10,000 for the books and the furnishings in the library. An extremely generous contribution, but it didn't stop there. He gave money for scholarships in memory of Charles Beard, actually, who's a uh, Unitarian minister here, he died in 1888. Um, Tate gave money for scholarships in his memory. History scholarships, actually, just interestingly. Uh, he gave money for technical scholarships, too, um, some £2,000. He also gave more money to the library in 1896. And if I've got my maths correct, and I've read all the documents correctly, I think he gave £49,000 to the University College. March by that by 60, and you get some idea of his contributions. About three million pounds in today's money. Um, it, it's, the, uh, it's about the greatest contribution in the 19th century. Um, second only to George Holt, whose bronze you can see on the next day, okay, some by the way. Uh, he gave about 46,000, as far as I can work out. Anyway, looking here at an extremely generous man, and all this after he left Liverpool to settle in London in 1881. He lived in South London, in where he incidentally paid for lots of libraries in South London. That's his other philanthropic contribution. So he did not forget his Liverpool roots, where he established his business. His business was still running in Lovely in any way. Uh, so all his contributions actually come after he leaves the city, which is interesting. Um, now, Sir Arthur Gilbert was an extremely distinguished sculptor by this time. I'm not actually sure the date of this sculpture. I don't know whether Maura can help me on this. No, she can't. I'm very good. Right, um, so I'm, I'm in the minority of two here. Uh, but clearly, um, Gilbert had established his, his um, reputation. Both these men, by the way, died at the age of 80. Isn't that a coincidence? So Gilbert's born in 1854, he dies in 1934. Um, Gilbert's career, well, he was educated at Alderman School in Hertfordshire. He went to the RA schools, as most people did in London. He went to train in Paris, in Rome, and then back under Sir Joseph Byrne in London as well. So they had a very, very thorough training. He was six years in Rome, for example, training as a sculptor. Um, so he had a very, very strong reputation. He was also a goldsmith and a silversmith and an artist, but he worked mainly, I think, in bronze in terms of his sculpture. Um, 
I don't exactly know why Gilbert was chosen specifically for this commission. Um, obviously, he has a reputation. You would have known the architect Waterhouse because they were both members of the Royal Academy. Um, there's probably other connections which I'm not actually sure of. Um, Gilbert's career took a bit of a downer in 1902 when he, began, was, when he worked, became bankrupt. Um, he started selling <coughs> bits of sculpture. Um, he'd been commissioned to do a mausoleum uh, for the Duke of Clarence, a member of the royal family, and he was running into trouble with it, and he started selling off bits of the sculpture. Um, he didn't go down to it, was a big scandal, so he had to flee the country. He went to live in Bruges until 1926 when King George VI didn't want to come back and finish the sculpture for uh, the Duke of Clarence, which he did. Um, and he was knighted in 1932, he died in 1934. Um, so Gilbert's had an interesting career. Now you probably know as uh, Eros was his, was his best known uh, sculpture in London, and the one in Liverpool was uh, cast uh, under his direction um, in 1932, in fact. Uh, there are lots of other well-known works around the country. Um, there's a very important bronze of Queen Victoria in Winchester Castle. In all these date from sort of 1880 to 1890, um, before he became professor of art and sculpture at the Royal Academy, in fact. Um, but he's, he's, along with a number of important architects like Brock, Boehm, who were knighted as a result of their, um, their sculptural work. So that's the connection between the two, and that's the important connection of Tate with the Royal Universities at Western College. That is why that bus is here. Thank you. If you have any questions, please ask. Excuse me, uh, it's a bit from the angle of the stuff, so I'm going to It's a different guy, but it's also taken because that was one of the libraries, in fact, in Brixton and Stratton, and not on the South London, but I can't remember it. I don't, I don't want to know who did that one, I'm sorry. Uh, if it looked quite similar, but it I should think so. I mean, it's probably very similar. I've got a photograph from Tate. That's it's like a different angle, but yeah, I mean, I imagine if uh, you were to done another copy, it would look pretty similar. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a good substantial figure. Um, but you know, to a very important man who revolutionised the manufacture of sugar, made it so easy for us to dip um, a cube into our cup of coffee and have sugar, rather than cutting off a great chunk from a loaf, um, and indeed was uh, very very generous to a number of causes. Anything else anyone would like to? to no. I just want to say that that picture there shows the libraries of Walter and Bill. It is indeed, yeah, I could have mentioned that um, a number of these buses, in fact, all these three, you may be able to spot somewhere in that picture there. Um, and the Argus, uh, interesting watercolor there, the Tate Library, which is different from what it is at the moment. You can go and see what it looks like now if you haven't been upstairs. Um, and I don't know what's happened to a lot of the other sculpture, whether it's sort of around. One of the mysteries actually I've come across, whether the stuff can help me here, according to um, Kelly, who wrote, who's written the history of the university, he says there was a plaque in the Tate foyer which says something like, sorry, I'm going to have to consult my notice if I get this quote correct. Henry Tate, merchant and freeman of the city of Liverpool, accounting the gain of wisdom better than fine gold, built and furnished this library as a treasure house of learning and for the goodly fellowship of students. Now, according to Kelly, that this plaque is outside in the Tate foyer. I've never actually seen it. Oh, there's an outdoor plaque. There's an outdoor plaque at the end of this building which says the part of this building containing the library is the gift of Henry Tate. But that's a rather more interesting inscription. Um, Maybe behind the lift. Or was it be hidden? You know, if you feel like it, if you look through the glass of the lift, I think you see it. Oh, look. Go on the lift. Go on the lift, you'll see it. Right. Anyway, so that, that's, what he was, that's what he was about. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, please wonder.